Um, Yogananda was uh, extremely challenging in his simple statement when he said, all conditions are neutral, whether you experience them as happy or sad, entirely depends on the predisposition of your own mind. And he furthermore said, if you make up your mind to be happy, nothing and no one can make you unhappy. If you make up your mind to be unhappy, nothing and no one can make you happy. And so it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's very challenging because we're all kind of, we like it until something really bad happens or something really good happens and all of a sudden we jump on that either side of the bandwagon and we're suddenly convinced that all, all of my ships have come in and now I can just make my mood dependent on circumstances. Um, the difficulty is that circumstances are always changing. And no matter how exactly we get things set, darn it, something always happens. And if nothing else happens, the whole, the whole incarnation comes to an end, or people that we care about. Very dear, uh, actually, a very dear woman, whom I only know lightly. She's not a, a personal friend so much. She was fixing Thanksgiving dinner for her two sons, and the telephone rings, and now she only has one son. You just, you know, just out of nowhere, from her point of view, except that his life was finished, she just didn't know it. And even though we don't want to be morbidly always expecting that, I feel it has to be taken into account that if our happiness is dependent on circumstances over which we really have no control, then we're always going to be vulnerable. And that's what makes us all a little anxious inside, a little nervous all the time. Even when we're very happy, there's this sort of realization in the back of our minds that something could happen here. Our soul doesn't mind, but we mind when it happens around us. Our soul is very happy with whatever happens because it's on a completely different journey. The ego has this idea that the purpose of life is pleasure and ease. And if you think about it, our definition of good is that it's pleasurable and not too challenging or only challenging in the extent that we think that's fun. But that's what we call good. Even we say good karma, bad karma. Bad karma means that something that was not pleasurable and not necessarily easy to deal with happened, and we call that bad. But from what perspective is it bad? It just depends on what the intention of the whole story is. Are we supposed to be born and be comfortable and make ourselves as comfortable as possible and die in that same state? Or are we actually here as part of a much bigger story in which we have a destiny that we only dimly suspect, but we still feel it? I've, I've been intrigued by this simple thought that we all know we're supposed to be happy. Because if we did not believe that happiness was a possibility, we would not be discontent when we suffer. I mean, think about it for a minute. I mean, we don't sit around, mostly, lamenting the fact that, you know, we can't fly, that we don't have six legs, you know, that we can't just pick this building up and move it over, unless you're a little crazy. But mostly we don't worry about things that aren't possible. They're just not possible, so they never enter our mind. But even in the most difficult circumstances, if it's not fulfilling us, making us happy, however we define that, we're always, we feel annoyed. Annoyed may not be the right word, but we're pushing against that. We're not resigned to that fate. We may have become so discouraged that we no longer put out an effort. But deep within, we know that this isn't right. There's, in other words, what you would call a soul knowledge there that bliss is our true nature. I was talking to friends uh, just at lunch, actually. and she was, uh, uh, The people I was talking to are as, are as deeply engaged in the path of self-realization and Ananda as I am, so it was peer-to-peer -peer in that respect. But one of my friends has a number of siblings, and none of whom are involved. And one of her siblings is a uh, psychologist or psychiatrist or a counselor of some sort. And my friend was talking to her, her sibling, saying, well, you know, the goal of life is to be happy. And her sibling said, oh, no, not at all. The goal of life is to be able to cope. 
with whatever happens. And then I stood back and I said, you know, it's not the given for people that happiness is even possible. A lot of people actually, it's almost like they want to get through with as little suffering as they can get through. They want to learn how to manage their life. Toward the end of my father's life, my parents were very good people and very supportive, but they never, they made it a small effort to comprehend what I was doing, but they never were enough on the same wavelength to understand it. They liked me because they could see that I was nice. And as my mother put it toward the end of her life, this was her grudging compliment. You're nice to be around. Maybe it has something to do with what you're doing. <laughs> it was the most I ever got out of her. It was enough. I didn't need more, thank God. You know, I was perfectly content. They could think whatever they wanted. It just was not relevant to me. Um, but when my father, the last few years of his life, I was, I was urging upon him. This was before I figured out more appropriately how to deal with them. I was urging upon him some more expansive view of a situation that he was struggling with. And then I just said, as a matter of course, well, don't you want to just learn and grow from this? He looked horrified. No, he said, just like that. He said, I, it just, I don't remember his exact words, but I just want to make it through to the end, meaning to the end of his life. Oh, I said, and I just completely, it caused me to wake up from my own worldview and realize what he really wanted from me, which was not what I was giving him, which was harassing him to embrace an attitude toward life that he had no interest in embracing. So people divide up. They make decisions. But even he, he knew that, you know, his happiness was to keep himself from suffering. I mean, he, he couldn't positively embrace happiness but he could definitely embrace, embrace its corollary, which is let's keep suffering to a minimum until I get, get through with this system, with this reality. There you are. He actually went, just, just since I'm speaking of my dad, my mother had Parkinson's for about 15 years, which is a really tough way to go. Although, she said to me, this disease has been the making of me. She said, I hate to admit it, but it's true. Because she was very willful and a little spoiled. And when she was faced with such a continuing challenge, it actually was the making of her. She was absolutely right. And since I fully believe she's gone on to another round of living, I think it was a great blessing. Now, there you are again. Like, was it good karma or bad karma that she got Parkinson's? I mean, on one level, it looked like terrible karma. And it was, it's a hard way to die. 15 years of it, it was a long 15 years, but it was the making of her. She was spoiled and willful, and she just got over all of that, because when, it, when she just really had to concentrate in order just to live, a lot of stuff just fell by the wayside that just didn't matter anymore. So in her next incarnation, she'll be a far better person. So was it good karma or was it bad karma? It was not pleasurable for anybody, it was tough on my dad. My dad in the last few years just, yeah, I don't know if he really had Alzheimer's, but he kind of went on a mental holiday. And when I saw him going there, I just thought, that's fine, Dad, just go there. It's been tough. Just like, I've had enough, I'm just gonna go on holiday. And fortunately, he had a very sweet inner nature. And he'd had a Virgo mind, and he used to torture us with concern for tiny details all the time. And when he lost the capacity to do that, he just became so dear. <laughs> he became so sweet. And he really had a very nice time at the end on his little holiday. That's what I always said. Oh, my daddy's just gone on a holiday. He's taking a break, you know, between this incarnation and the next one. He's just going to take a little break. Interesting. But you see, it's all really on how you frame it. And I don't mean that as in, a, in a tricky way, but it really is how you frame it, where you've been, where you're going. That's what really counts. Now, inherent upon this worldview is the fact that you believe that we've lived before and that we will live again, or at least that we're going somewhere. My uncle, just, who died at 95, just totally believed that when, you're, when you die, that's it. Just bingo. I just, 
I, I wanted to say, but I didn't. You're such an intelligent man. How can you possibly believe that? But he did. And he was, oh, so not interested in another point of view. He was also charming, since I'm talking about aging relatives. He also got a little mentally off. And he was a very intelligent man, but he was a bit, a bit arrogant, and he didn't suffer fools gladly. And so he had a lot of experiences in which he was the only person in the room who knew what was going on, and everyone else was an incompetent fool of some sort. And as he got elderly and his mind cracked a bit, he was just like when your mother says, if you keep making that face, your face is going to freeze in that position. He was much worse. If you keep thinking those thoughts, your mind is going to freeze in that position. So like an older person, he would recite the same stories. He loved to tell the stories of when everybody else messed it up and he was the only one who knew what was right. And then he would get angry all over again at how incompetent they were. <laughs> so I was just, when, after we'd been through one of his cycles of telling those stories, when he was sort of thinking of something else, I said, you know, do you enjoy reliving all those times when you got angry about other people's foolishness? He looked at me like, how stupid can you be? He said, of course, just like that, <laughs> which caused me to burst out laughing. <laughs> and I just thought, of course, this is where he wants to be. You know, this is, he's still having the same pleasure, which is in the egoic satisfaction of being so smart. This is his definition of happiness. And, whoa, I'm not going to change him at this point. He's not at all interested. And the, the wonderful thing about a bigger flow of time, which is where I'm going, is that there's a certain relaxation that sets in. I mean, on one hand, many people are quite, um, many people are quite delighted that they get to do it again. Others are horrified that they have to do it again. The usual comment is junior high. That's the part no one ever wants to do again. <laughs> I think if you could reincarnate and skip junior high, then a lot of people would be willing to reincarnate again. <laughs> That's the one that gets you. I, uh, I, a woman friend, her baby, her little baby girl, would never poop in her diaper. She, she wouldn't poop. She would develop terrible stomach cramps. And finally, somehow, this woman's mother figured her out. And literally, they would hold this tiny infant over a toilet, and then she would be willing to go. It was just so undignified as far as she was concerned. I mean, they may have projected all this on the child, but she just, to be in a poopy diaper was so beneath her, she couldn't stand it. She would rather, you know, have stomach cramps. Another baby friend of mine who was a very dignified boy, I came in once and his mother was changing his diaper. The child, you know, here's his little diaper. He has the, his upper body stretched like as far as he can and he's looking as far away from it as he can possibly look. Maybe this was just projection, but I walked into the room and he just appealed to me with like, is there anything that can be done about this? <laughs> it was just, this is so humiliating, you know, to just be so helpless. Nowadays, with the internet, there's all these strange things coming up that are really proofs of reincarnation, although they're seldom presented like that, which is extraordinary child uh, prodigies of people just being able to do things. And one that somebody sent me, as some nine-year-old girl in Holland, they have all these talent shows, you know, so it's all coming out to the, and it's all on YouTube. It's really actually quite fun. This is a fun age. She's like nine years old. She stands up to sing. She has a mature, um, um, probably a mezzo-soprano voice. I mean, she's undoubtedly some extremely famous opera singer. She has, this, woman, this girl has never taken a lesson, and she sings like a mature, trained opera singer. I can see this woman when she died. She just said, I am not losing all that I've gained. And some part of her just held it. So she's otherwise just a little girl, but when she starts singing, she, she, I mean, she sings beautifully. It's not merely that she sings cute for a child. If it was a recording, it's, you would name some famous opera singer. She's undoubtedly one of those. I don't know who it would have been. But it's, it's, there's a whole cycle going on here. So what I was saying about happiness is a whole lot about time. It's about whether we think everything lasts forever uh, Swami Kriyananda said the reason people say that hell is eternal is because when you're suffering, it feels like it will never end. And that's where that idea comes from. And when you're happy, you believe it will never end because we're so dumb, you know? 
We just completely forget, especially when it's situational. Oh, he really, truly does love me. I've, in my life, I've had, I'll call it an opportunity, to perform a lot of weddings because I'm a clergy person and I belong to a large community and I've been part of it for a lot of years, so we've been through a number of generations of weddings. And I've learned to enjoy them, let's put it that way. I've learned to enjoy them uh, because I think there is something lovely about it. I mean, there's certainly a lot that's lovely about human love. I myself am very happily married, so happily married people are often happy to see other people get married in the hope that something similar is going to happen for them. I believe that it's possible. But there's also this increasing um, lack of enjoyment of the idea that now that everything is in order, it's going to stay that way forever. You know? I'm, I'm not inspired by new romance. Many new romances, nonetheless, are very deep. You know, with, and have deep dignity to them, and it makes no difference how old the people are. There's real um, maturity, even if there's uh, youthful enthusiasm and vivaciousness, there's a real soul energy there. So most, almost all the weddings, I'll just say all the weddings, since some days people might see this and I may have actually done their wedding. <laughs> <laughs> it's partly the result of age, it's partly the result of increasing wisdom you realize that it's nice, it's lovely, but there's a deeper fulfillment. Swami Kriyananda said something that's so important. He said, we learn a certain amount from having our desires disappointed. You know, we learn a certain amount. We learn to cope with disappointment. We learn that what we thought we had to have, in fact, what do you know? We don't have to have it, that there's life beyond whatever my simple definition was. But interestingly, he said, we learn more from being fulfilled. And there's a divine principle that says all desires eventually have to be fulfilled before we can ever transcend in self-realization. Because full self-realization, and I don't just mean being a little brighter than the average man on the street, but full self-realization where as I was saying, like Ramana Maharshi, where he can just meditate in the basement of the temple and be completely oblivious of this world, means that we understand that all fulfillment comes, with, with, comes from within, from raising our energy and attuning ourselves to the divine flow. And even if, like Yogananda or like Kriyananda or other great souls, take a body and live in this world and relate to everybody, they never are really living like we're living. Kriyananda said in the early 70s to me, he said, I never identify with Swami Kriyananda. He said, Swami Kriyananda is an event that I am responsible for. And, and, and I saw him demonstrate that countless times over the years that I knew him. It was a very extraordinary opportunity to know, to be that close with someone who had his consciousness for so long in so many circumstances, because I saw theory changed into reality over and over and over again. And, and for so long allowed me to, to be bewildered. And then as my own life experience um, developed, to begin to look back and be able to see w what I was dealing with. I'll give you an example just for fun. Um, I was 22 when I first met Swami, and he's like 23 or 24 years older than me, something like that. So he was in his early 40s when I was in my early 20s. When I moved to Ananda Village, which was a little more than a year after that, um, I very quickly became his secretary, his personal assistant. I started working with him, and for, for a lot of the next 10 years or so, I was in virtual daily uh, contact with him. Then um, I thought I would spend the rest of my life with a little notebook and a pencil in my hand just following him around. But he informed me about that time that that wasn't going to happen. He said, I had to go out and do a lot of what I've done. He, and I said, he said, uh, it would, you wouldn't be fulfilled in this incarnation if you don't do that. If, if I don't send you off to do something else. My response was, 
why don't we just try it and see how it works? <laughs> we can decide at the end if it was a good idea or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, he's been very, he was very sweet about it. He still even, to his last years, would say that it was a sacrifice for him too. It really touches my heart. But in any case, so, Time passes, I meet my husband, we get married, Swami sends us to Palo Alto where I've been since 1987, long time, building a whole community. I, I get to be my mid-40s, my mid-50s, my mid-60s. I'm working with people now who are 25, 30, 40 years younger than me, you know, a lot younger than me. I'm looking at myself at the same time. And, you know, these are bright, capable, you know, in their own right, fine and wonderful people. Sometimes, though, it's very tempting to say, you are an inexperienced twerp. <laughs> <laughs> it just crosses your mind to want to say that, you know, <laughs> because you get impatient. <laughs> and you're also out of touch with current times, and so often what the next generation suggests you think is a bad idea. One of my friends who actually at that time was manager of East West Bookstore in Palo Alto, um, she had a young woman working for her who was some 25 years younger, and the manager says to me, she looks terrible every time she comes to work. I really need to speak to her. I said, honey, before you do that, you should find out if she is the height of fashion. <laughs> so my friend did a little research and discovered she was the height of fashion. I said, don't embarrass yourself, just leave her alone. <laughs> I said, she's a beautiful woman. I can't believe she doesn't know how to dress, regardless of whether you and I like it. So I just began to realize, and then this is what I remembered, that in all the years I worked with Swamiji, all the years, in all the circumstances, and as many times as I exasperated him, which he confessed you know, <laughs> later, thwart was the word, you often thwarted me. That's his word, and I, I gave him a global apology, which he accepted without demur. He didn't say anything like it wasn't so bad or anything. He just said, <laughs> I said, I owe you an apology. Yes, he said, just like that. You know, this is like after it's all passed. <laughs> um, but he never, not one time, ever, referred to my age, my inexperience, my ineptitude. Never, not even with a rolling of the eyes, and I know for a fact, even from his own confession, I tried his patience many times, but he never showed me. So when I began to understand this, I went to him and I said, Swamiji, I want to thank you. Because of course that gave me a sense of uh, my own potential. And which was not invalid, you know, I've been able to accomplish a fair amount in my life and, I'm, and I owe it all to him, so it worked. I said, thank you. And now that I'm in your position, I realize what was going on. And he accepted my, my uh, gratitude, but he had a look on his face which I know tells me that I haven't understood this completely. And so after he accepted that, and I said, you never commented on my age, ever. And then he, he looked slightly puzzled and he said, I never noticed. I said, and then he said, I never notice how old anybody is. He said, I don't, physical age, he said, the soul is ageless. And somebody who's seven years old could be far wiser and more advanced. Merely one life, one incarnation tells you nothing. He said, I, I, look at, at, I look into people's eyes and I look at their consciousness and that's all I ever see. And then I respond to that consciousness. Even, and if you're dealing with children, you'll respond appropriately, but you're still. In the same context, he, a couple in our community who seemed very ill-matched anyway, they were getting divorced, and I was at a dinner table and Swami was there, and I mentioned that they were getting divorced, and we were sorry that they were getting divorced, but I said, you know, I'm not at all surprised. And I mentioned that I had gone shopping with the woman for a birthday present for her husband. I pulled a shirt off the rack, and I said, oh, this would be beautiful, it would match his eyes. She actually said to me, would it? She says, what color are his eyes? I mean, at the time, it was like, this is a little scary. How could you not know the color of your husband's eyes? So we just, you know, I just threw that into the dinner table. It's like there was obviously some disconnect in this relationship. Then Swamiji, again, he got that look on his face. And this woman was sitting next to him. Her name is Seva. She had been his right-hand person for 
15 or 20 years. Her salient feature is these huge brown eyes, huge expressive brown eyes. Everybody in the world knew her eyes. And he said, I don't know the color of anybody's eyes. He said, I never look at anybody's eyes. I look into their eyes. And then he turned to Seva and he kind of went like this. <laughs> and then he said, oh, they're brown, like that. And, and so what, what that tells you, that tells you that there's a lot more than affirmation that's possible. And there's a lot more than disciplining yourself to have right attitude. There's an actual shift of consciousness where you just become something else. And that's really where we're going. And so when, from where we're standing, when we think about happiness and unhappiness and suffering and all of those things, it looks like an, an effort of will. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to change our actual perception of reality so that we just experience it differently. Now, that's a long-term fix. We can have short-term fixes that are easy, more accessible, but we'll eventually outgrow them. And so when I was saying today about this, whether or not this is an arduous path, the fun thing about the path of self-realization, and I'm not just saying my Ananda path, because the path of self-realization is everybody's path. It just depends on where we are on it and how we articulate it, is that it just goes on and on. You just don't reach the end of it. For me, that was such great fun. When I started so young, I had reached the end of a lot of things really fast. And it was actually very freaky to me, because things were supposed to last and they didn't, like college and you know relationships. They just finished. So when I got into this one, I didn't know. And it's been so gratifying to me that it just keeps moving out in front of me. And then, therefore, um, it's always an enjoyable challenge. There's always another step you can take in the direction of where you really want to go. And no matter how uplifted you become, you realize there's more. I can discipline myself not to be impatient with my young friends, but how much more fun to ha not have that impatience even arise. But just to be delighted that, isn't that fun? Everybody's different and we're all doing different things and we're all learning in our own way and what a joy to see people expanding. I mean, isn't that step by step? That's what we're looking for. Now, I know that you have to leave, so um, do you have any uh, questions or comments on what I said before I shift into another flow here? I don't mean to leave you guys out, it's just that we've got this sort of birds on a wire kind of picture here. <laughs> These are my Ananda friends. So. <laughs> so, do you ladies have any comments or thoughts before we go on? Okay, I'm going to have some fun here with my picture about time. I must confess, I love doing this. I heard, have heard, um, enlightened people, great saints, talk about the illusion of time a lot. You know, there's Eckhart Tolles has done people like me a great service by publishing a book that so many people have read about the power of now and the illusion of time. And I find, I've, I have to confess, I've read, I haven't read his book. I've read fragments of it and people tell me things. Um, it, it's a philosophical treatise and his basic advice is do something about it. <laughs> he doesn't explain all the reasons why it's difficult, but at least he gets the picture in your mind that there's some other reality. I've heard Swami Kriyananda talk about the illusion of time over and over, and I could never understand it. Every time he would try to tell me about it, every time he would teach it, and I heard him speak hundreds of times, I would always act as if this time I was going to understand. <laughs> and I would like clear my mind of all doubt, and I would focus in, and then it would just go right over my head. He would talk about a planet where nothing ever moved, where the sun never rose, where there was no light and dark, and, and I would just, uh-huh, uh-huh, and I'd just zip. Then he wrote a book, a juvenile fiction, a, a, like a story for all ages, but it's called The Time Tunnel, and it's about two little boys who discover a ruined laboratory, and they go into this tunnel, and they uh, put themselves in light spheres, and they go forward and back in time. He had a lot of fun writing it. He wrote it toward the end of his life. And it was like, we were talking about it, that how, how fun it was to write philosophical fiction, 
because you didn't have to really back up anything you said. <laughs> you could base it on, on what you knew to be true, but you didn't have to persuade. You could just throw it out there. So he wrote it philosophically true, but he didn't have to explain it. But he was also explaining to juveniles, uh, uh, adolescents and teenagers, about time. So I finally understood it. <laughs> or at least I got a perception I never had. I asked him to write. Bible commentaries for children, Bhagavad Gita commentaries for children. Just like, you know, explain this to a 10-year-old and then I'll get it. That would be very helpful to me. So uh, I got this picture and, and I'm going to uh, just put it up here. And this is, I think, more or less true. They all talk about, you know, the scientists and so on, and I'm not at all scientific at all in my thinking. But they all talk about past, present, and future happening simultaneously. And I find that very difficult to comprehend because I don't feel that exactly, except when I stop and think of it like this, which is by now having become so persuaded about reincarnation and having had a few interesting experiences. I am not like Walter or like many of the people here who move between the worlds. I, I don't. I'm, I'm just like so appallingly here, just real steady, solidly in this world. But at the same time, I intuitively, intellectually and intuitively, have a lot of understandings. And I had one dream of a previous incarnation that was totally the real deal. I, I knew it when I had it, and I talked to Swami Kriyananda about it later. He confirmed it. And it was a very difficult relationship that I had with a person who was uh, close to me physically, but in fact we were, we were often, very often together, but was a, there was a very, very negative vibe between us, an almost insurmountable negative vibe. We finally finished it, thank God, but it was a long story. So I dreamt this incarnation, which happened at a time when people had carriages with horses, and there were kings and crude ways of killing people. These are the pieces that were part of that story. And <laughs> I was a revolutionary. <laughs> what a surprise. I was a revolutionary <laughs> against an unjust ruler. I was trying to escape with my husband, the unjust ruler, which, who was a woman, a queen, captured us, killed my husband. And it was gruesome. And it went on all night. I, I would fall asleep, I would wake up, and then I, I, so I lived the whole thing. Interestingly, just as a little twist, I, the dream started with me living as a nun and, and as a very happy nun. And somehow or another in the dream, which was the past life, which I believe, the other women, I had, a, I had, an, I had assumed a name when I entered the convent because I was notorious. And somehow or another, the other women had found out who I really was. And they all knew this dramatic story of my life, and they were all commiserating with me. And in the dream, which is where it started, I said, oh no, it, it, it was difficult at the time, but it's all brought me to here. And therefore it was in here, meaning to the peace of this religious life, and therefore it was as it should be. And then the life revealed itself to me. Now, the point of all of that is that I, was, I became aware that all things are happening simultaneously because the queen was the woman that I had to see every day who I absolutely despised and was terrified of, terrified. Like if I was ever in a car alone with her, I could hardly stand it. Any point at which she had power over me just put me into a near panic, completely unreasonable. Now, just for fun, she later, once she got, I never told her, I have no idea who told her about this past life because I did not tell her. She heard about it, went to a psychic and found out the horrible things I'd done to her, which, I, trust me, were just as bad. You know, just completely ruined her life in really, really dramatic, horrible ways. Finally, Swami Kriyananda got us both together and said, <laughs> look, he said, I'm inclined to believe that all of this is true. And that was, you know, he inclined to believe is his gentle way of saying this is true. He said, but you both changed. You would never behave like that now. So he was giving me a very important lesson about what to do about past karma is you realize it's past. But what I also realized is that it was not past. I was greeting her in 19, 
you know, 85, well, this was more like 75, 1975, and it might have well have been 1600 or whenever that took place. It was as if it was yesterday. It was just completely there because, you know, it's all happening. It's all happening because we do not forget. I'm drawing this line down the middle of myself because our chakras register the vibration of all our experiences Physical death, we take off our physical body, but we take the energy body with us, and the pattern that we have created in there of disappointment, of anger, of hatred, of fear, it just unchanged. We forget our names, we forget the details perhaps, but you meet the one who did it to you, and you know who you're looking at. And you meet your old husband, you know, and you're terrified that he's gonna leave and not come back. I mean, all of these things happen. I uh, was talking, I, I'm, I'm not given to, to phobias as a rule, but when, my, when I was traveling a lot with my husband, uh, uh, during a few years when we were traveling a lot together, I developed this extreme anxiety in the airport if, he, if we were like waiting at the gate and he would say, oh, I'm just gonna go walk around because we're not boarding for half an hour. I, I became panicky when he would be away from me. And it was so out of character that he didn't even take me seriously. And at first he just kind of brushed it off until I finally communicated to him that this is not a joke, that if you're gonna walk away from me, you have to come back at this moment and you have to come back at exactly that moment and not one minute later. And it wasn't enough for him to say, of course I'm not gonna miss the plane. I mean, don't be crazy, total panic. And uh, gradually I talked myself out of it because I realized this is a sensible man, he's not going to miss the plane, this is so nuts. So I'm talking to a group once about this and afterwards this woman, Zana, came up to me and she has a lot of capacity to see other realities. She said, while you were talking I saw you, you were an eight-year-old girl, your mother had died, this, and this is hard for me even actually even to speak of this, your father couldn't take care of you. He took you on a train to a town far away, and he just left you there. You know, <gasps> wow. As soon as she said it, I, it's either apocryphal or accurate. Yeah, I know, that's what, I, sometimes I cry when I say it. But as soon as she said it to me, it was very interesting. I had this, uh, this multiple reactions. One was just, you know, absolutely, the heart just broke. The next one was, that was a very important life. I learned a lot of things that I have really used ever since. And then I also realized mm, a lot of the faults that I developed, I also developed in that life. Mm, interesting, true or not, it's apocryphal and it tells me what I need to know. But you see, so is this now or is it then? And if it were possible to look to the future with the same energy, and see yourself acting out the consequences of this life, and the consequences of this life are just playing then. Is it then, or is it now? You know, the, the material world is a slippery thing, isn't it? And whatever is going to come is going to be a result of what's happening right now. You know, we're going to all walk out of this room just a little different than we walked in, because of the causes that we're putting in at this particular moment. So here we are, past, present, and future. So at the center of past, present, and future, I'll put a star for the spiritual eye, is the now. And the now, of course, is eternal. It's always, because it's always now. It never isn't now. This is what Eckhart Tolle told us in so many different ways. It never isn't now. So confusing, isn't it? Especially, we're of an age where we really clearly remember when it was then. <laughs> There's a lot of then, yeah. And it's really surprising to be now. I, someone sent me a picture of myself with a couple of my uh, long, lifelong women friends. And uh, they were, my friend wrote back to me, wow, we were gorgeous. <laughs> you know, we never felt like we were at all, but you know, it was also a very flattering picture. But we were, when we were of that age and had all that whatever you call je ne sais quoi about being young. We were really nice looking ladies and very different looking than we think of ourselves now and then. It's all just like it's so confusing. Okay, so here's the eternal now and there's the past, the present, and the future. And let's say the present is us right here, like this. 
Now, even though all of this is existing, um, Yogananda has a fabulous definition of the word ego. Ego equals the soul. Soul is not a real accurate word in English. The actual word in Sanskrit is jiva, which means the um, unique bubble of consciousness that is our individuality. The soul identified, and identified is also a great word, identified with the body. And he means mostly the physical body, but it's actually also the astral and the causal body. But at the moment of conception, sperm and ovum comes together, we commit ourselves to that particular body, we identify with that body. And we make it with our life force. We're born into that family. We assume a gender, we assume a nationality, we, we assume a language that we're supposed to speak, we assume all the realities of that. The jiva is infinite and is untouched, but it has identified with the body, and that's what ego is. It's, it's not like it's an enemy, really. It's just a fact. We've identified with this. So once we identify with one body, I'm no longer that nun in the 1600s. I'm no longer that little girl who was uh, left on the railway. And the more, the more ego I have, the more I deeply identify with the fact that I was born in El Paso, Texas, to Jewish parents, I moved to California when I was 15, that I dropped out of Stanford, that I've been at Ananda, that I'm American, I only speak English, my skin is this strange pale color that I was speaking of, which just seems like such a waste, you know, all of this, that I have naturally curly hair, <laughs> and that this is my natural color, <laughs> but it never grayed. <laughs> okay? All of that. It's right there. And every single bit of that is just a question of my physical reality. And I used to be a lot younger than I am, and soon I'll be older than I am now. And there'll be a certain point at which I'll be gone. I had a wonderful dream that I am immensely proud of, if you can be proud of something that is not about pride. I dreamt that I was in this big sort of, it's just like a place, and there was just like a big empty stage, like an empty theater, except all I could see was the stage. And I was there with a, a, a man who's a very dear friend of mine, and I was going to be executed by having my head chopped off, and he was going to do it. And it was kind of just very casual between us that it was time for me to be executed, and he was the one who was going to have to do it. And, you know, he, it, not, neither of us, he, he didn't even really apologize. It was just understood that I had to be executed and he was going to do it. And he was holding one of those big battle axes, like cartoons, you know, the one that's kind of has that strange thing like that. And, and there was kind of like a little tr tree trunk or something, just a flat thing. And, and we chatted about this and that for a few moments. And then it was time for him to chop off my head. So I laid my head down like that. And, he lifted up the big battle axe. He's rather a strong, big man. Lifted up the big battle axe. It was on its way down. And just as it was on its way down, the thought flashed in my mind, oh, this could hurt. <laughs> Hadn't, nothing had crossed my mind until then. Then I remembered, which I, uh, people have been talking this weekend, when the body is about to be demolished or seriously hurt, often the jiva has enough sense to get out of there before the impact. And this great fear that we hold that, oh, so-and-so suffered, the, the soul doesn't because why would, you know, it's over, I'm going to leave. So I remembered that as the ax is coming down, and I realized, oh, I can just get out of here now. I don't have to wait till my head is actually chopped off. So I exited. And I started shooting up. I didn't go through a tunnel of light or anything, but I started shooting up in the dream. And the more I, I shot up, the more he, he was just this tiny little reality in this huge expanse of nothing, just this tiny thing. And as I'm going up, I sort of just kind of lean over and I say, bye-bye, Asha, just like that. <laughs> and then I woke up and I was so happy. It's like, oh, Lord, if I can. You know, I've, it's been a great run. I've totally enjoyed most of it. And what I haven't enjoyed, I've enjoyed 
for not enjoying it, right? And when it's over, I would really like to just be able to say, did what I came to do. How deeply are we identified with this body? Yogananda says something also very interesting. Many people who are very materialistic believe that consciousness is a factor of brain activity. They don't understand that brain activity is a factor of consciousness. So he said, if you only believe that you can be consciousness through a brain, when your brain begins to die, you feel obligated to go unconscious. <laughs> and so you do, because your brain is dying and you just don't know what else to do, so you go unconscious. And he said, you often don't wake up between the worlds because you do not know how to relate to a non-physical reality. So you sleep, it's just kind of like he called it a gray dream. You're just kind of, you know, like you are just mostly asleep, but a tiny bit awake, perhaps. Let's see, we were saying... Uh, oh yes, you don't wake up. But if you have done anything to persuade yourself that consciousness exists outside of the physical world, then when your physical body begins to die, you can just go with this. Oh, I know this place. Even if you've never had magnificent experiences, you, you still understand. If you've meditated at all, prayed at all, felt communion with the greater reality, your jiva is not so deeply identified with the body that it can't imagine a reality without it. And you can see all the, the really positive reasons for doing that. Now, the more deeply identified we are with the physical body, even you can see, we can't really see much behind and we can't really see much ahead because we're on that plane. You know, you're just right here. And so people who are deeply identified with their body, very strong in their egos, you talk to them about past lives, they don't know anything about past lives. You talk to them even about the influence of their childhood on their present existence and they'll dismiss that. Oh, you know, I just coped, everybody has to cope like that. You talk to them about their, their, their present actions affecting their future, and they don't even know that. They don't understand that, gee, you bullied your son from, which, from when he was a small child, so naturally he doesn't want to come and see you now. Oh, he's just a selfish, ungrateful. You know, just no comprehension of past or future. I mean, you can just see it in, in a very, uh, you know, biteable, uh, non-metaphysical reality. The more identified you are with what exactly is going on in this body right now, the less perspective you have on past and future. So it really, for you, is not all existing at the same time, because this is where you're standing and this is your reality right now. Now, when you begin to understand even a little bit that you can identify with more than just this body, that you can think about yourself as a spirit, you can think about yourself as part of a greater reality. You can think about yourself as a child of God. You, and, and everything that moves you closer to the origin point of yourself and all of creation. Then you, your perspective, let's just say you meditate a little bit and you realize that there's a reality greater than yourself. There's an eternity. Now all of a sudden, look, you can kind of see a little bit about the future, can't you? you can also begin to understand the past. Because as you see, and this is a very important point about spiritual growth, and this is a contributing word that's always been part of our lexicon at Ananda, directional. It's not all or nothing. It's not like you go from being deeply identified here to flip, you're in eternity. But you, you grow little by little. Huh, maybe the reason I dislike this person so much is because Maybe we had some history that started before this life. Maybe the reason I first, the first time I saw my husband, I thought he was so adorable, is because I wasn't really seeing him for the first time. You know, maybe there'd been a little history there. Oh gosh, maybe the reason everybody's so mad at me today is because I've been bullying from them for a long time and that's why they don't like me. Or I've been thinking really judgmental thoughts about lots of people and so that's why they're all mad at me now. Or I've been uh, really negative about my own possibilities and what do you know, they've fulfilled themselves. When we first, uh, we, the community that we live in, we actually lease and it's an apartment complex. This is in the Palo Alto area where we live. And we moved into it, we took possession of it um, 
and there were a lot of the original tenants there, and it, it was a, a, a unique fixer-upper. So the people who were in it were not necessarily, well, they were deeply identified with their bodies, let's just put it that way. And the apartment that we, we started living in was right uh, where the driveway was. And at 6 o'clock on a Saturday morning, one of the tenants pulled his car out of the parking area, parked it right there, which was right outside our bedroom window. And all the apartments were the same, so it was right outside our bedroom window. He wanted to fix his car. He opened the hood. He turned on the radio really loud at 6 in the morning, feet from our bedroom window on Saturday. I was just sitting there thinking, where do I even begin to explain to this man that this is a bad idea, <laughs> you know? But he was so deeply identified with his personal reality. And then, of course, I projected, because I'm always thinking this way, I projected out that other people are going to be inconsiderate of him, and he's going to be so shocked. He's just going to be stunned. How, how could they possibly not consider my well-being? Because he was so narrow that he couldn't see the karma, karmic causes he was setting in place. And a great deal, and since we're talking about happiness, a great deal of our happy, uh, happiness and unhappiness is because we identify so deeply with the moment, we have no idea where, what's causing it from the past, and we have no idea what seeds we're sowing for the future. And now this is why people say, don't worry about anything, just meditate and it'll all work out. Because the concept of meditation, if you're doing it properly, and there's many other solutions besides that, is that you begin to, to I'll use the phrase, disidentify with your physical body and you move your attention, literally, if you're practicing in the correct way, to the spiritual eye, which also has a star in it. And the more, well, in the chakras, this is the point where the ego identifies with the body. This is the opposite pole of where the jiva identifies with the infinite. So we move our attention from the ego to the infinite. And it's just a question of where we're looking. And when you enter, when you become fully enlightened and you enter into this eternal, this awareness of eternity, in which Swami Kriyananda, I never identify with Swami Kriyananda, he says, he is merely an event for which I am responsible. So it's, his consciousness goes all the way from eternity to the moment, but his sense of self does not go to that because all everything is happening at the same time. Now, just that little perspective changes everything that we're experiencing because, first of all, whatever is happening now is a continuum from what happened before. And whatever happens in the future is a continuum from how I respond to what's happening now. And we can work the cause and effect here, or we can solve everything by moving toward here. Um, Swami Kriyananda used to appall us by talking to us, sometimes in extremely graphic detail, about the fact that when he would go to the dentist, he would not take Novocaine. I hated those stories, <laughs> and he would tell them to us often. I finally figured out why. Anything that we're afraid of, we eventually have to face. Almost all of us are afraid of physical pain, and we mostly, by the grace of God, most of us don't have to face a lot of physical pain. So I finally figured out he was always frightening us with these terrible stories just to give us an idea of being a little more courageous than we are. So he would describe, well, he said, if somebody's, I mean, I'm talking like root canal extractions, I'm not talking about fillings. And he had very bad teeth, so he always was telling us these stories. And uh, he, he said he concentrates on something else, like writing music or figuring out some philosophical point for a book. If he can't concentrate if he can't distract his mind from it, he'll try to concentrate on the pain itself and see if he can dissipate it by concentration. And if that doesn't work, he says, well, it's been a good life, a little pain won't hurt me very much. In other words, instead of identifying here, we move toward the sense that this is just a moment in time and this is my true reality. Swami said something else that was fascinating once. When he was a child, he was born with a very exalted consciousness. And when he was a very little child, when he would lie down to go to sleep at night, 
he said this light would appear, and this is of course when you're meditating, you practice trying to see this light. This light would appear, this is, and he would stare into that light until the light expanded and he was absorbed into that light. And he thought that's how everyone went to sleep. Because that's what always happened to him. He would just close his eyes and he would be absorbed in the light. It was quite a long time before he found out that that isn't how everyone went to sleep. Various things happened to him as have to happen and he moved away from the e- that ease of entry into that world, became miserable, found his way back to his guru, learned to meditate. And when he learned to meditate, he saw the same light and went into it in the same way. And then he remarked, as he put it, no time had passed that when I went back into that light, it was exactly the same moment as it had been when I went into it when I was a child. Because time happens out here, but in the, in the center, it's the eternal now. It's always the same. Now, this may look like a very challenging way to be, but it's very interesting if you think of it as directional. And you know, we've all, we all face things that we find very difficult, whether it's a lawsuit, a divorce, a death, a, a hurt finger. You know, we, things happen to us that depending how deeply we identify with that little dot on this vast continuum is really pretty much the measure of how much we suffer. Or how much all we do is suffer. If, I, if you can think of it like that, if I, if I were to draw a dot right here, and then I were to stand here, you know, it's like, it's pretty complete. If you, you know, if I, if I pick this up and <clears throat> it's black and I just am like this, it's very, very black. And everywhere I look is black. I mean, that's my honest appraisal of my experience. If I take this and hold it out there, it hasn't changed color. And see, this is an important thing to understand because sometimes people try to make themselves happy by saying, oh, look, now it's green. A friend of mine uh, suffered a very serious betrayal from someone she had trusted. And it was emotionally shattering for her and she was working hard to come back from it. So she went to Swamiji and said, Swamiji, I've been really meditating on this. And you know, everything that happened was just right. It was just what what was right. He said, no. He said, that person behaved very badly. (laughs) And he said, don't comfort yourself by telling yourself a lie. Which I thought was very interesting. You know, that person behaved very badly. He said, expand your consciousness and then see it in proportion. And that's, that's this. It's black. You know, that person made an unfortunate decision, which will have repercussions in their life. But, you know, I don't have to deal with that. That's not my issue. But it's black. So it's just a question of where, what I identify with and where I am in relation to it. Okay? Now, to be affirmative, to think positively, again, you have to be standing in truth. And truth is, wow! That was a humdinger of a bad experience. But into every life, a little rain must fall. And probably, this is the tricky part, I set something in motion that caused it to hit me. Why would it have come to me if there wasn't a connection? Whether or not I did the same thing to someone, whether Divine Mother is just blessing me by giving an opportunity for me to learn something I never wanted to learn. (laughs) Whatever it might be, don't comfort yourself by telling yourself a lie. Back up from your identification. Identify more with the infinite. Well, this is painful. There you have it. But when it's, you know, I will learn something. If I'm willing to, it's still just as black as it can be. But there it is. The, the possibilities of freedom then become enormous. This also brings us into the law of karma because... If it's all a continuum, people ask that question, you know, cause and effect. If you take any aspect of your life, any aspect, you know, the the scarf that you're wearing, the fabric that I have on that I had this dress made out of, 
I go and I happen to be in Gurgaon, India. I happen to be staying next door to a particular mall, so I don't need anybody to drive me. I happen to walk in. They happen to have a bolt of this fabric. It happens to be just the blue that I want. They happen to have just the, how did that fabric ever get in that store? Who made it? You know, somebody somewhere made it. Why did they make it? Why did they choose to dye it this color? I don't find this color very often in this particular fabric. Why was it still in stock? Why did not somebody else buy it? Why did the buyer think it was a good idea to have it? What put it into my head? Why was I in India? Well, I was in India because in 1969 I met Swami Kriyananda. Like, what can you cut out of that interconnected web, even to get me to have this dress on at this point? I mean, how trivial can you get? Although it is nice, isn't it? But nonetheless, how trivial in the greater scheme of things. But it's, abs it's connected to the fact that Paramahansa Yogananda incarnated and came to America. Because if he hadn't come to America and Swami Kriyananda hadn't met him and I hadn't met Swami Kriyananda, I never would have been Gorgon in Gorgon. I wouldn't be a Naya Swami and I wouldn't have been looking for blue. <laughs> you know, so everything, you can just bank on it. Whether you understand it or not, isn't that a funny expression? You can bank on it? That's, a, like, that's money, isn't it? <laughs> wow, you can bet money that this is true. Whoa, is that convincing? <laughs> you know, really. But you can. So here we are, from this perspective. Oh, it's natural. It's inevitable that that would happen. It, would, it was inevitable that Asha would panic when David left her in the airport even though he wasn't leaving her, because she remembers the one who didn't come back. And then she gradually got her head together and she stopped worrying about it. She worked hard to get her head together so that she wouldn't be panicked anymore. But see how differently then? Everything that happens to us, every little tiny thing that happens to us, we just stand back just a quarter of an inch. I mean, it's such a little shift to identify wholly with what's happening now or just to identify with a greater reality and a greater and greater reality directionally. Every, every single unhappiness can be resolved by understanding time in its right perspective and our identification with the body. All right? So, thoughts or questions? We have just a couple more minutes before our allotted time is over. There's a story I'll tell you. If this is in Acts of the Apostles. This is in the Bible. St. Paul apparently was very, very talkative. <laughs> and apparently he liked to hear himself talk. And he was in a room, probably not dissimilar to this one. He was in a second story room. It was a hot night. The room was extremely full. And people were crowded everywhere. The windows were open and people were sitting on the window sills. <clears throat> apparently Paul went on for a really long time. Somebody sitting in a window sill dozed off, fell out the window, and died, hit the ground, and died. Paul actually talked someone to death, <laughs> which as a public speaker, I've always really thought, I don't know whether to admire him or not. <laughs> but then he went downstairs, then he went downstairs and resurrected the chap. <laughs> so he didn't, he really did. This is in the Acts of the Apostles. He brought him back to life. So, my philosophy is, if you can't resurrect him, you have to stop at your appointed hour. <laughs> so we have a few minutes. <laughs> Do you have any questions or thoughts that we should comment on before we give it up? Yes. Well, so it seems like what you're saying is just getting too identified with any experiences can be problematic. To define yourself by those experiences. But you see, the wonderful, the wonderful thing about this is you can still commit yourself to them. You can still give your whole heart to everything. You don't have to hold back. You don't have to. You are, this is an event for which you are responsible. Think about it. If you're giving a party, you have to give it really well. You know, what's going to be on the tables? What are we going to serve? Who are going to be the waiters? What are they going to wear? Where are they going to wait? How are we going to clear the dishes? If it's going to be a classy event, you have to commit yourself to every detail of it. You're not going to get out of it by doing it badly. Right. But you don't identify with it. You give it everything you have, but it's just something I'm doing. It's not me. Yeah, it's a huge difference because some people try to be detached by being uncommitted. 
That's how Swami put it to me. You don't get out of karma by doing it badly. Yeah. When I first married David, I had this very, very strong thought in my mind, to be poor is to be spiritual. I mean, this was, I was not of the prosperity, you can have it all school. I was of the old stone cell hermit school. To be poor is to be spiritual. So I lived in this nifty little trailer that was completely impoverished and falling apart. So there was no question that I was spiritual. My husband, completely different orientation. It's all energy. What difference does it make? Everything is energy. So, it, you know, you don't have to be poor. You don't have to be rich. You just deal with energy as you're supposed to deal with it. And by circumstances, it happened that Swami Kriyananda suggested we build a house next to his house at, at the community. They're just a little house, but nonetheless. So to have a house for me, of course, this is most people's ambition. To me, it was a nightmare. Because if I had a house, how would I know that I was spiritual anymore? So David just entered into this and started designing this, what turned out to be a really charming little house there that's still there. And uh, I just kept trying to do it badly. And finally he said to me in his very sweet, rather laconic way, if you're not going to be helpful, get out of the way. <laughs> And that was when I was talking to Swami. He said, no, you don't get out of karma by doing it badly. You know? And he had his reasons for asking us. He knew what I was dealing with. You know, you have to do it right. You, have, you can't just be sloppy, lazy, and afraid. You have to commit yourself to it fearlessly. What, have I got to, what do I have to fear about having a house? Especially Swami asked me to build it. It's right next to his. What could be wrong about this? I need to commit myself fully. The danger is when I identify with it when my happiness becomes dependent on what I've identified with staying the same. That's why I was so happy when I died and I just said goodbye. Bye-bye. You see, it's very, very different. But from the perspective of the eternal now, you see in the eternal now, the reality of consciousness extends all the way to the edges too. Think of the tree, that's my image always. Tree comes from the roots, but the last leaf is as much the tree as the root. And in fact, the more beautiful the tree, the more farther it reaches out, and the more elegant every little leaf is. And he can't be uncommitted to those leaves. It's all part of him. And so it is with us. We are the eternal now, but we extend out, and we, we are an event. We have to be responsible, and we have to do it perfectly, as perfectly as we can, fearlessly. So what about committing and being fearful and doing it? Well, that's, that's directional, okay? At least I'm doing it. I'm doing it quaking in my boots, but if I know it's right, I'm going to move toward it. Yeah, directionally. You can't do it perfectly at the beginning, but how will you ever learn to be good at it unless you throw yourself into it? And of course, fear is always, well, God knows, it comes from a lot of different places, but it never serves us. Fear itself is the karma to be overcome. <laughs> 